morning, guys. This is Miss Thompson. I'm going to do a quick little lecture on women's suffrage and women's right to vote. So this is focusing mainly on the time period we're currently in for Unit 2, which is 1890 to 1920. But we are going to jump backwards in history just a little bit to like the early 1850s as well. So women's suffrage. Here we go. All right, so supporting question number five of Unit 2 is how did women fight for the right to vote? So keep that in mind as we go through this assignment or this presentation, I'm sorry. So what is suffrage? Suffrage literally means the right to vote. It's not like suffering, it's suffrage. So women's suffrage would mean women's right to vote. So if you just say suffrage, that just is an in general thing, like the in general, the right to vote, you have to be specific and say women's if you're talking about women's right to vote. So where could women vote in the late 1800s and the early 1900s? Not um, in a lot of places, like anywhere where it's like a darker blue. Women had the right to vote, so like Alaska, California, Oregon, Washington, Montana, mainly in the West. But all these lighter blue colors, they could not vote in any of these states prior to 1920. So just keep that in mind. Like some places were getting there, like looks like the earliest one I see is like 1869, 1889 in Wyoming. Um, but some places like didn't get there till like 1918. So it's not like they were super early to the party. So why couldn't women vote? Uh, the founding fathers did not put anything about women voting in the Constitution. They kind of left it up to the states. Uh, at first, in America, only white male property owners could vote. Uh, eventually, that was expanded to all white men. And then the 15th Amendment, after the Civil War, expanded that again to allow all men to vote, so regardless of race. A big reason that men back in the day used for not allowing women to vote was that thought women were childish and irresponsible and basically just couldn't think for themselves. They would not be able to make a responsible decision when it came to voting. Uh, so they just didn't let them. So where did the like women's suffrage movement kind of start? It actually started a lot earlier than our current unit's time period. It started in the 1840s and 50s. A lot of the people who were fighting for anti-slavery or to end slavery were also like, well, if we're going to end slavery, we might as well make everyone equal, including women. So in 1848, a group of women and men met at the Seneca Falls Convention, where they're going to talk about like the women's right to vote. And we'll talk about them on the next slide. Um, but because of the Civil War, women's right to vote kind of took a back seat to the anti-slavery movement because like, well, this is like, we really need to end slavery now. Like this is our chance to end it and we'll come back to the right to vote afterwards. So the Seneca Falls Convention, it was led by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott. Uh, it was a group of men and women. So it wasn't just women, there were men there too, where they talked about why women deserve the right to vote. And they actually wrote like their own Declaration of Independence. They called it the Declaration of Sentiments. So it sounds a lot like the Declaration of Independence if you read the actual text, um, but it just goes into why women should be allowed to vote and how men have like not treated them fairly like male politicians by not allowing them this right to vote. So just like the Declaration of Independence, they list their grievances or their problems with their government and say, you know, it is a founding principle of America that if the government is not doing its job and not treating everyone fairly, then the citizens of that government do have the right to overthrow that government and create a new one or to help the government change. So that was the Declaration of Sentiments. After the Civil War, so post like 1865, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who we saw on the last slide, and Susie, Susan B. Anthony formed the National Women's Suffrage Association, where they were really pushing for everybody to be included in that 15th Amendment, not just like all men, but like all people. That didn't happen, which really sucks. Um, eventually, this group would kind of um, align themselves with other women's suffrage groups and create uh, NASA, which is the National Alliance for Women's Suffrage in America, NAWSA. People call it NASA just because it's so much shorter. All right, so here's like an example of what uh, like propaganda or like advertisement kind of things that the women's suffrage movement would use back in the day. So you can see it just like is encouraging people to give women the vote. And this would just be like a carriage that's riding through town, suffragettes, women fighting for the right for women's suffrage would be standing in it just to draw people's attention. Um, like I'm like in the way. 
1913, Alice Paul, this is her, and Lucy Burns formed the National Women's Party, the NWP. Uh, they were the two founders of that one, which a lot of times would butt heads with NASA and AWSA, which is that one that was started in 1890. NASA thought that they should fight for women's suffrage like state by state, like go to individual states and slowly get the right to vote for women. And NWP was like, no, we're going to go to the very top, we're going to go to the national government, and we're going to get an amendment to the Constitution. Uh, the NWP is seen as like a more extreme or radical group uh, just because they use like more like in your face tactics. Like they would have parades, protests, all that good stuff. So here is one example of a primary source document from back in the day. Uh, the women's reason to vote because women have to obey the laws, just like men, they pay taxes, they suffer from bad government. Um, they work, you know, like these are all reasons why women should have the right to vote. And then here's just an example of suffrage headquarters. So how radical was the NWP? That's the one started in 1913 by Alice Paul and Lucy Burns. Like I said, they did organize parades, which would sometimes get violent because people who opposed women's right to vote would make it violent. They also protested outside the White House, like right where the president was. They'd be like right in his face when he was coming in his car holding their signs. They went to jail and in jail, Alice Paul actually organized a hunger strike and she was eventually force fed because she was trying to draw attention to her cause. Uh, here are examples of the suffragettes outside of the White House holding signs. So Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? What will you do for women's suffrage? And they're wearing like little sashes that say where they went to college. So these women were well-educated. Like people couldn't say like, oh, they're just doing that because they don't know any better. Like they're well-educated women who know that they deserve the right to vote. All right, so here's another example. They're using Woodrow Wilson, president of the time, um, his words against him. So we shall fight for things which we have always carried nearest our hearts for democracy, for the right of those who submit to authority to have a voice in their government. So Woodrow Wilson is saying this about other countries. So these women are like, well, why don't we you know, do this in our own country? Why don't we give women the right to vote? And then after Alice Paul, the leader of the NWP was arrested and sent to jail, they would include that in their picket signs as well. So to ask for freedom for women is not a crime. So suffrage pr prisoners should not be treated as criminals. So people who are protesting shouldn't go to jail. Here is an example of Alice Paul in jail and a little uh, like a newspaper headline from when she was force fed about her hunger strike. So that was really gaining like national attention. So the fight was finally won. President Wilson was horrified at how the suffragettes were treated in jail because he definitely had no idea what was going on. So he said because they were doing so much for the country during World War I, really stepping it up, working in factories, getting jobs, and like supporting the troops overseas, they should be allowed the right to vote. So in 1920, the 19th Amendment was passed, gave all genders the right to vote. So here is the text of the actual 19th Amendment. So the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be, shall not be denied or abridged by the U.S. on or by any state on account of sex. So you can't limit people's right to vote because of their gender. So 100 years later, uh, we've only been able to vote for 100 years as women in this country, which is kind of insane. And there's a lot of, you know, protests and fights still going on for women's rights, especially like minority women's rights. Um, and we can go into that a little bit later. That's like a whole separate issue. But this was a really brief overview of women's suffrage and how women fought for the right to vote. Uh, we're going to go over more in class, I'm sure. We're going to look at documents and have a good old time. But just remember, women have only been, been able to vote in this country for 100 years. And in some countries, they like just gained the right to vote like in the 2000s, so less than 20 years. So it's a little insane. Uh, just keep that in mind as we move forward, and I hope you guys have a great week.